Uh, yeah, we're only we're only missing uh, Emmanuel and Satoshi at this point, unless they've joined. And let me find my agenda again. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And I'll apologize in advance for my lack of voice. Um, I'm just getting over a week-long bout of Ebola or something uh, that I caught in Vegas. And apparently everybody else did as well that were in Vegas last week um, for the IBM conference. So, so thanks and welcome, everyone. Um, I think we have... Um, I, I'm not sure if we have a completely full agenda. We'll see how how this all plays out. Um, there's, a, there's a few conversations I think need to be had. Uh, so we have on the agenda thus far, we have uh, a discussion about the face-to-face. Uh, I think, Todd, uh, uh, maybe you can just sort of recap the uh, the results of the Doodle poll, and, and uh, we can figure out what the logistics are. and. Um, uh, nail that down, and then we're going to have J.P. Morgan. Um, uh, I guess, David, are you going to go through and, and present the J.P. Mo uh, Morgan proposed contribution? And uh, and then we'll have a discussion of the project proposal template. Um, I'd like to add to that uh, just a notion of a life cycle. I mean, this is something I think has been discussed a little bit on the mailing list, but I'd like to actually start um, to solidify that so that we actually have a formal life cycle process for this project. And, um, and then there's a number of things that I think um, are ongoing. Actually, we should add to this the, uh, the requirements. Um, I'm still looking for somebody to sort of cat herd the requirements work group uh, to gather up the use cases and requirements so that we can then start putting them through a, a triage process to understand whether they're in or they're out or high or low or medium in terms of their priority. Um, and, uh, and then there's the white paper, which again, I apologize, but because I've been flat on my back, uh, I, I hadn't really got a chance to turn around and, and get a, a sort of a, an empty white paper posted that we could start noodling on. And then there's the code of conduct that, again, I apologize, but I think, uh, uh, Mick and myself uh, have been sort of working behind the scenes and we'll try to get something um, to, the, to the list that we can all start discussing um, uh, in short order and we can have a brief discussion about some of those things. Are there any other agenda topics for this morning? Um, if you want to speak up, speak up. If not, you want to type it into the chat, that's also acceptable. Hearing none, I guess we can proceed with that. So maybe Todd, if you could um, sort of recap for us the doodle poll results. And um, uh, so uh, let, let's start thinking about the dates of the face-to-face -face and logistics. Sure thing. So we sent out a doodle poll last week, taking a look at the upcoming three weeks as potentials for a face-to-face. -face. Uh, based on the responses we've received to this point, the, the overwhelming uh, majority seemed to favor the week of March 21st. So at this point, we would be looking at doing a, a three and a half day face-to-face, -face, um, looking at doing Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then a half day on Friday. Uh, so that way, anyone that needs to travel in or out it makes it a little bit easier on them. Um, so at this point, as of uh, yesterday, late afternoon, we're searching for space uh, at one of the JP Morgan uh, offices in or near Manhattan. Um, Dave, if you have an update on that, please feel free to chime in, um, but don't want to put you on the spot. So uh, otherwise, we'll definitely follow up with this group shortly and um, nail down firmer logistics so people can start making travel plans uh, for this. Yeah, Todd. So, um, yeah, I was able to uh, talk to our central reservations. And in fact, we have space available for those dates. Um, we're looking at uh, leveraging our, our Metro Tech uh, Center for Metro Tech Center in Brooklyn. It's just, you know, two, two three stops off the two from, uh, from Wall Street. And uh, 
it can hold, you know, uh, at least 150 or so. If if it if we have something in the range of 100 people attending, then um, you know we we could have what they call the, a cluster type of arrangement. But if it's going to be something above that, then it's going to be more of a classroom style. So we you know we can work out some of the logistics around that. But uh, it looks like uh, you know the the facility is available and um, and it's a a really nice setup, so you know I think it should should work out fine. Excellent, that's awesome. fantastic. Um, so Dave, I will connect with you uh, later today uh, to nail some of this down, and then we'll be back in touch with everyone on the TSC list for the the firmed up logistics, so people can solidify travel plans and all of that. Sounds good. Excellent. Thanks, thanks to uh, both Todd for running the poll and. And JP Morgan for um, offering the host. This is this is really good news. Um, just uh, on on the face to face um, again, I want to emphasize this is going to be a um, a, a very much a working meeting. Uh, I expect there to be an awful lot of code written. Um, 150 people would be awesome. I, I'm a little bit worried about cat hurting that many people. I don't want to you know scare people away, but by the same token. Uh, I do think that it's important that we get the engineers who are going to be actually working on this together. I think there's going to be opportunity also for us, as we're at face to face, to be working on the requirements and uh, potentially on the white paper. So I think there's two or three different things that we could uh, be off collaborating on. So I think that people who are thinking of coming should think about, um, you know, what their role is going to be and how they intend to engage and participate. Uh, probably around those three things. If there are other activities that people think that we should be looking at doing as part of the face to face, then um, you know, we should discuss that now. Okay. Yeah, Todd, you want to take it away? And if you're not speaking, if you could please go on mute, that would be very helpful. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm not hearing anything, so I think that's uh, going to be it. So we'll work on getting the actual logistics. Set up so people can, you know, make travel plans and book their hotels and so forth. Um, we'll start building, um, uh, if you will, uh, uh, an agenda and a, you know, a set of uh, set of actions. I'm hoping that, you know, for the engineering, that we can have, um, you know, a set of, um, you know, that we can have a set of items to be to be picked up and worked on uh, collaboratively. Um, in, in a backlog, uh, and so we have a little bit of work to do, and I think that we can use next week's call to sort of try to um, finalize some of that thinking. Um, so next up on the agenda then is uh, J.P. Morgan's proposed contribution, and Dave, if you want to take us through that, is there a... Um, yeah, so... Yeah, actually, uh, Will Will Marino, and you can see him in the uh, Martino. I'm sorry, <laughs> Will Will Martino. If you see him in the attendees list, there, he'll be uh, presenting the deck. Um, uh, I'll just kind of, you know, if you could give him screen share capability, great. Yeah. Uh, so just a little, just a little bit of a background. I'll kick off, and then I'll hand it off to to Will. Um, can everyone you know, see the deck before you start? I I can. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you. Yeah, so so um, Will's going to be taking us through um, you know, some distributed ledger technology that that we've been working on at J.P. Morgan. We got a couple of we've been doing a, a couple of different projects, and this one is particularly interesting. It's it's um, it has some very interesting properties uh, that we're calling it Juno. Um, there's also a smart contract language component called Hopper, and a, and uh, another component called Masala that uh, handles sort of a it's a and a, an EVM type of uh, uh, technology that was tested with with this stack as well, and you know this is something I think uh, the group started with um, around last September or so. It's very well suited for high volume use cases. So you know uh, a lot of the existing technology you know we've seen with blockchain not so good at higher volume transactions, and some of the use cases we're looking at are in, in the area of you know. 200, 300, 400, 500 transactions per second. So this is this uh, design that we'll be uh, we'll be uh, giving you a high-level overview. Uh, you know, 
shows how we could approach that and some of the design decisions and trade-offs you know that are required to achieve some of that level of, uh, of volume and I also just want to point out you know it's not finished yet it's still a work in progress but we've been having some very good uh, results from our testing and uh, and then and in fact the the stable version of the code um, has has just been posted to github uh, and so people could you know download it take a look at it and uh, as we're you know discussing our future state and components and plugs in you know we think this is interesting technology that people would be interested in learning a little bit more about for you know again for specific types of use cases so with that I'll just hand it over to you Will Great, thank you, David. Uh, I'm Will Martino. I've been working on the uh, Juno project at JPM since around September. We were experimenting with other systems before that. Um, for Juno, we began by thinking about, we began by going back to first principles with regard to um, what we actually need for a distributed ledger with a smart contract system. Um, one of our beliefs is that we actually don't need the capacity for anonymous participation and actually it's something that we really don't want, at least for enterprise applications. And because of that, we looked at alternative methods besides proof of work and proof of stake for uh, finding consensus around you know, a globally shared view of the world. And with that, we ended up looking at um, Paxos, PFT, RAS, and a bunch of other things. For Juno, we ended up going with a version of RAS, and why RAS? One of the big reasons is that it was designed to be simple and understandable. Um, which I found to be very much true. Uh, Paxos is pretty tricky to understand. Um, it also provides us with consensus around inputs and not as much around outputs. So if you give it a deterministic state machine, it will give you um, a global order for messages that go into it. And if the state machine is deterministic, then it gives you some guarantees about where that state is. We'll get more into that a bit later. RAS has also been formally proven. Um, we were working on converting the Verity RAS implementation from Cock over to Haskell and then actually ran into Tangarella, um, which we'll get into in the next slide. But um, the other thing that we really liked about going with RAS is that single leader is very attractive for performance and system visibility, also for no forking. Um, and it's also explicitly and effectively right behind. So that slow nodes don't slow down the entire system. You come to consensus around the inputs and the ordering of the messages, but you don't come to consensus around what the outputs are. So a slow node doesn't actually, a definition has to slow everything else down. And by BFT hardened, um, we went with Tangro, which is a BFT hardened version of RAS. Um, it is, was developed by Copeland and Bang out of Stanford. Um, it's a complete RAS implementation that has BFT hardening on top. We say BFT hardening because it's not a true BFT. Um, it is BFT around consensus only. Uh, it has lazy votes for preventing election clutter and also additional crypto signatures on basically all the messages. Uh, but BFT hardened versus BFT, um, specifically we believe that this is, so Juno is designed to be used on a non-public network and both BFT is sort of a definition and application specific undertaking. Uh, Tangro implements just the Byzantine fault tolerance around consensus and application-specific fault tolerance can be implemented separately afterwards if need be. Um, all the messages between all the nodes, uh, between the client and the cluster, between the admin and the cluster are all signed. And uh, our internal version of Tangaro, which hasn't been open sourced yet, we just open sourced the last stable demo version. Um, that one also fixes significant issues with the Tangaro code base and protocol. Um, where a new protocol begins and enhanced protocol ends, not quite sure, but we'll be figuring that out as time comes along. Um, with regard to performance, Juno offers uh, considerable performance benefits over other solutions that we've been looking at. The unoptimized version of Juno um, that we have running on four nodes on a MacBook Pro um, has a throughput of about uh, 500 messages a second, best for consensus, uh, latency for consensus of around uh, two milliseconds. So that is the time it takes for a entry for the log to be received by the leader, for it to be fully replicated, and then committed to the, uh, the log itself. And the throughput of the hopper language, which we'll be getting into later, seems to be about 1,500 transfers a second. Um, that one's completely unoptimized. I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. It's also worth noting that the version of Juno that's been open sourced on GitHub, the link's at the end of this uh, presentation, 
uh, will show performance that's about 10 times slower than the numbers listed here. Um, this is mostly due to uh, slow logging and synchronous program application in that version of the system. Uh, these issues have been fixed in our internal branch, but we don't want to sort of got pushed the release a little bit sooner than we wanted, and as such, we couldn't get the really good version that we have internally out the door just yet. We want to make sure that it's working before we actually put it out there. Um, we can comfortably forecast getting a two to three times performance increase. There's some basic optimizations that we haven't even touched yet, like GC tuning, uh, batching log entries, and message layer configuration. Um, in production, latency is a factor of the longest network latency to a quorum node, meaning that once you need a majority of replications before the leader can step forward. So whatever the longest time it takes for that evidence to come in is effectively the impact of latency by um, the nodes. The node count doesn't have a huge impact on throughput or on latency, really, mostly because it's mostly a function of this network latency to hit the majority, and everything else gets washed out because the servers can run through the proof that are required through Tangrail pretty quickly. Um, some future work is to make it fully right behind uh, application execution, so that long-running programs don't actually hamper the consensus computation. The system's also very amenable to a gossip protocol, but we haven't hit that yet. Um, some novel system properties. So, RAFT offers a general state machine stepper. It doesn't need to be a deterministic state machine. Juno supports non-deterministic state machines, but it ultimately prefers deterministic ones as they underwrite the system integrity. Because Juno and Wrath and Tangrel guarantee uh, deterministic ordering of execution, so deterministic ordering of the inputs that are going in, and it's with a deterministic state machine, then that also implies that deterministic inputs um, equal deterministic outputs. If output of the deterministic state machine is a bit, and this allows for very cheap verification of the emergent application state. Um, Hopper does this. We're going to get into it, I think, on the next slide. Um, it currently supports EVM, although that integration isn't there currently. The first thing it supported was schemes. Um, we believe, actually, we know that it would be quite easy to integrate with external non deterministic state machines if you wanted to. You can think of that as just the input you're going to give a Python REPL, for example. Um, the log itself is, you can think of it like a single transaction. You can think of it like a blockchain that has single transaction blocks, and there's no forking at all in the system because the leader is giving absolute ordering to everything that goes in. Um, and every transaction is, the entire log is incremental hash, so every transaction is hashed against the prior entry in the ledger. Um, some future work is using a deterministic state machine and predictable state. We are currently looking at how to offer a verifiable application state. Um, we're thinking of hashing, doing the incremental hashing at the state diff level as well as the log level. And the individual diffs, therefore, will verify the entire state up to that point. We have a few different options we're thinking of. We haven't decided on which way to go yet. Um, the simple one is just to, every time, I don't know, every minute, every half minute, every time you need it, um, a check by message goes through the system, and the system comes to consensus around what the application state should be, the hash of that. Um, other ways for it to work are that the leader checks it, or that we actually include the you know, four or five step behind hash of the state of the dip in, of the state dip incrementally hashed in the append entries response. We're considering a few options there. We're not entirely sure what the right answer is. As for smart contracts, um, we are also developing our own language. Uh, began by, actually Stuart began by uh, implementing the Ethereum bytecode VM uh, in Haskell, and we use that as a way of learning the thing, learning about the things that we really like in that system, and also realizing things that we would like it to have had. So the Hopper language is currently being headed by uh, Brian and Carter Schoenwald. It's also been open source at the link at the end. It is um, a system that's designed for simple code for that <coughs> using one of two service languages. The service languages are on the side right now. Currently, transfer is a primitive in the language, and it's been made quite pretty for the first, the transfer syntax, the second one being the transmatic list-like language. Currently, Hopper is um, little more than a uh, lambda calculus that has a bunch of stuff coming down the pipeline, but it's not quite done. It's still in its early stages. It does currently have very informative error messages of a cat not found or insufficient balance. It's inherently transactional, which is really a wonderful thing. There's no real control flow or observations of the current state. 
you just send in a program and then Hopper tries to run the program and if it works, it works and if it doesn't, then it gives you the error. Um, it's fully deterministic and the output is a diff if it succeeds and if it fails then it's just a legible error. So in future work, we have a lot of ideas for the future on this and we're working very hard on it. Um, ownership model that ex ownership models that can be expressed in the language via linear types. Linear types are a wonderful thing because they will help, they will allow you to raise runtime errors that you would run into into the compile time such that you can't double spend, you can't write a program that accidentally creates or destroys money. <coughs> Types. A true module system that's likely to be dependently typed as well, and a execution cost model, um, something similar to GAS but more simplified. As for persistence, um, right now we have a few different queries that you can do against the ledger. Um, some of these are on the internal branch, some are on the external. Uh, simple ones such as a ranged query where you say you want to find some transaction before, after, between some log indexes. Uh, clean queries that I have to undergo full consensus. This is an issue that I believe it was Council or FTD ran into that Afer found on his blog, wherein you could get a dirty read out because the read actually has to flow through the entire consensus model to make sure that it's in a good state. And also just a final dirty query wherein a local node just responds to you instantly. And there might be some in-flight log entry that impacts your read. Um, we also have some ideas for some other more interesting types of queries, something like a polls query, where you ask a certain number of nodes what they think, and you take the newest entry that they respond with. And if that number of nodes is one, then it's a dirty query, and if that number of nodes is uh, a, a quorum, then we think that that is a tantamount to a clean query. We're not entirely sure. We're still thinking about it. Um, the data is in a key value format, so any key value store, it's quite easy to put it in. Um, and our current integrations for log storage are SQLite. Uh, adding others isn't that hard, it's just we are currently using SQLite. As for privacy, um, we haven't fully figured out, I mean, the, the wonderful thing that we would all want is the ability for everything to be private, but for there to be mass conservation and everything that we need so that you can protect against double spend. And we haven't cracked that nut yet. I personally don't think that that technology exists yet, at least at the crypto level, but I hope that it does exist at some point soon. Um, right now, we can persist uh, non-transactional encrypted data alongside transactional code, and it implies um, external encryption shared between two transacting parties outside of the system. This future work would <coughs> allow us to have um, local node encryption and decryption so that only some nodes would be able to see some portions of the larger and other nodes wouldn't be able to see other portions. Um, this, to a certain extent, will destroy mass conservation, so making sure that double spend doesn't occur. We haven't cracked that yet. Um, for local node encrypted smart contract execution, this is sort of running hot in a non-transactional mode. It's an even more, it's an even less protected version of the previous version, or of the previous thing that I was discussing, wherein and we just compute the, we decrypt and compute, and there's no real assurance. At that point, Juno would just be a cryptographic, um, sorry, an encrypted uh, crypto messaging system. That gives you absolute ordering, but outside of that, it doesn't give you a ton of guarantees. And as for community contributions, um, we recently open sourced Juno, Masala, and Hopper. Uh, Juno managed to hit the front page of Hacker News yesterday, and now it's a bunch of attention. I don't quite know how, so we found it. Um, that one's under my name. Uh, Masala has been open sourced by Stuart Popejoy. That would be the EVM, the Ethereum VM. And Hopper has been open sourced under Spark. Um, I believe that is the end. Um, I would welcome any questions anyone has. Very good, thank you. Yes. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, we have an appointment. If you're not speaking to the group, could you please go on mute? It's very distracting. Yes. Hey, this is Deutsche Börse. Just a quick question. Why are you guys using uh, Haskell as programming so language? If we, can, like, if we can do it either one day before, that would work, or if we can do it like first thing in the morning, that would work. I've gone ahead and muted everyone. It was a phone caller, so I couldn't individually mute them. 
Um, so you, if you, you have a question, please come off mute. Thanks. Um, sure. We may have to we may have to try it in that particular mode um, at least until we get um, you know the right sort of behavior. Thanks, Todd. Um, so yeah, as Todd said, if you need to speak, please come off mute. Um, so um, uh, I want to thank uh, J.P. Morgan. I think there was a question on why Haskell uh, in the. Yeah. Want to address that? Yes, Dr. Boza asked that question. David or William? You guys need to uh, yeah, off mute. We, we, yeah, we we got this double double mute thing. Uh, well, yeah. if if you want to respond to that one, you have to have to hit the little phone in the <laughs> up up on the thing. But I'll take a I'll take a crack at it. For one thing, you know we've got some really bright uh, Haskell developers, <laughs> and they're very passionate about the the benefits and all that. Um, another and Will, if you're there, if you want to jump in here. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I found I something. Sorry. There. Um, so the main reason that we went with Haskell, I mean, we already actually had a internal Haskell team that was working on a few other projects, but the main reason we went with Haskell is because the Tangaroa paper was paired with a Haskell implementation, so we were able to get off the ground quite quickly. The demo that you see on the open source repo, we got that up and running, actually I got that up and running within about a week of running into the code base. I was able to do that just because I had had experience working in Haskell in wraps, specific applications before. But, I mean, that's one of the main reasons. The other reason is that for language engineering, especially in things like Hopper, Haskell is just the best. Um, the type system just helps you the most, and it is basically the most advanced thing for doing things like that. Also, it gives us a lot of security, and honestly, it really helps with hiring. We're able to find really sharp developers who want to work in Haskell that we otherwise probably wouldn't be able to grab. We have a very, very passionate Haskell team at, at, at J.P. Morgan. <laughs> Any other questions? This is Mike. Um, got a different question for you. Um, uh, what are the characteristics uh, um, as far as the deployment and tests? Um, so I know you're running a bunch of uh, sort of high, high number of transactions through. Um, is this a local or global deployment? Um, uh, um, right now, it is local. Um, we have done most of our testing just on a single system. We unfortunately don't have the ability to do a geo-distributed or even really multi-server um, setup quite yet. We should be able to actually have the ability in about a week, a little bit less. Um, this is mostly just due to internal things with APM. Um, but we hope to be getting this on AWS now that it's open source and testing on there and do some geo-testing as well. Great. That, it looks like great stuff. Thank you. Anyone else? I uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, I, but probably you. I'm not sure whether you mentioned this or not. Uh, what what language uh, Juno is implemented in? And and also, you you talk about uh, Raft. I, I I read about that. But uh, in 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 what um, could you characterize the the deployment environment in such a way Raft would be good for? Okay, um, so first off, all of the things we've discussed today have been implemented in Haskell. Um, you can go and see all the code online uh, with the links at the end of the slide. And um, good things that Juno is designed for is really specifically enterprise applications that aren't on the public facing internet. Uh, there are certain, I mean, Bitcoin derived technologies have the ability for anonymous participation and they're also robust against just sort of people throwing garbage at it. Our version is somewhat um, reliable against that, but it's not. We wanted to get higher performance, and as such, we took out certain things. So it's really meant to be run either on an intra network or a intra firm like setup that is where the pipes connecting them are either lease lines or are encrypted pipes or are protected in some other way. It's really not meant to be, you know, it's not like a blockchain or a Bitcoin blockchain like setup where. You can just run a node and put it out in the internet, and it's robust against anything that can happen. It's really meant for enterprise applications where you don't want certain features of Bitcoin, but you do want higher performance. Does that answer your question? 
Is there still yeah, a concept yeah, of blocks? Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks. Uh, we, yeah, we, uh, as, as you know, we go with uh, uh, PBFT uh, because of uh, assumption of uh, a set of Byzantine conditions uh, when uh, nodes uh, in in different networks, um, you know, collaboration between among companies uh, that are not in, uh, if, if 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 you will, in 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 well uh, protected uh, area, uh, in such a way that we uh, might not have the security assumptions um, uh, that 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 we. Uh, that we want the network to operate in. Um, so I, I get. Okay. I mean, I think I get what you're getting at. Um, there are certain. Um, I mean, we have some forward thinking on dealing with some of the issues that I think you're discussing. One of the main ones is removing our or replacing our messaging uh, substructure with something that's using TLS for much higher protection. We haven't gotten to that yet. Um, for Byzantine failures, I mean, the Byzantine fault tolerance is just this very large idea that has a bunch of different ideas based inside of it. We believe that we only need to be robust against some of the set of things that Byzantine fault tolerance covers, mostly because um, we believe that in an enterprise deployment, the organizations using the system are going to want to have a big red button that says send the system into read-only mode, something's going weird. You know, you have some massive network partition. You know, a shark bites bites the uh, fiber optic cable connecting. I don't know, uh, Britain and the U.S. in half, and all of a sudden you want some backup system to be able to say, all right, go into read only. Something really screwy is happening, and hang out until we can actually have some human intervention. So, certain cases we are explicitly chosen not to care about, or not to care about from an automated programmatic perspective. One of them is a faulty leader scenario because that is always really application specific and need an oracle for it and a few other things, and we basically believe that if this thing ever gets deployed and gets a lot of um, adoption, then there's going to be a button somewhere and there's going to be a team somewhere that says, all right, the leader's faulty, something's going wrong, so send in a command, uh, take down the leader server, have the system lock the new leader. Are there any other questions? Is, do you still have the concept of blocks? Um, to a certain extent. The reason I used blocks in my description was that, my description of how the log works is that it's easy to think of the way that the log that we're using works as a chain of blockchain blocks where there is a single transaction in each block instead of a group of transactions, instead of like a set of them. Um, the reason for that is that what RAP does is it orders messages in the form of your log and gives them an absolute order. And so we do have a concept of a block, but it's really just a single entry block. So it's really an incrementally hashed log or an incrementally hashed list, but it looks enough like a single transaction block that we feel comfortable in calling it one. The one thing that we don't need to be robust against because we're using a leader consensus algorithm is having forks in the chain. They just can't happen. And if, they, if you notice a fork in your chain, that means that the node that's noticed the fork is probably faulty and needs either go and fix whatever is wrong or need to go into read only and ask for human assistance. So there's a question in the chat about whether or not Hopper is Turing complete. It is Turing complete for a while. It is not something that, so our idea is that we want it to be Turing complete, but we don't want full Turing completeness because you don't want an infinite loop. So everything is bounded. And that's going to be verified at compile time. So it, we'll be able to do many high-level things. You can think of it like, a, like an Idris or, Idris or an Agla or something, uh, you know, a dependently typed functional language that can have multiple service languages up. And you can compose functions, and you can compose ownership, and compose a bunch of other things. But ultimately, it won't be Turing complete in the way that you can do infinite computations. All computations will be finite. But they will be deterministically stepped in a very similar way to how gas is used in Ethereum to compute the execution cost model. Okay. Thanks. And can you send the deck with the links? I mean, people are interested in sort of chasing some of these things down. Um, how do I do that? 
or David, can you handle that for me? Chris, we'll get it posted with the minutes and get it posted to GitHub uh, later this afternoon. Okay. All right. I, I think that, like I know I was interested, and I think others are also interested in just chasing down Hopper and some of the other uh, code drops and so forth. Sorry, was that a question? I couldn't quite hear you. Yeah, so it, it's it, the scenario, the, the, the primary scenario that, that you demonstrate, uh, or at least in the slides that you talk about, uh, it seemed to me that also around in surrounding uh, asset transfer, uh, are there other scenarios that, that the environment could address? I'm sorry, your board, I couldn't quite understand what you were saying. Can you repeat the end of that one again for me? Uh, yes, it, it seemed to me from the the, uh, the slides that, that, that you discussed, um, the environment seemed to address one particular scenario in my understanding is asset transfer. Uh, my question is, are there other scenarios uh, that the system would be able to address? Oh, um, I think that you're discussing how Hopper only has the transfer command. Um, right. Yes, yeah. uh, so Hopper is still in its early stages, but we have three very, very sharp guys working on it. Um, and it is going to be, it, uh, I'm having a hard time coming to the correct word. It's going to have just a few primitives that you can compose on top of each other, and it should be able to model basically any ownership type situation. It is going to be a domain specific language for effectively anything where you have assets that you don't want to create or destroy, but you need to be able to transfer ownership and track and escrow and all of these other things. Right now, baked into the demo that's been open source and into the demo branch that is out there um, is just the transfer command along with a couple of the primitives because it's still pretty early stages, but we're making huge progress in Juno, I'm sorry, in Hopper, and I would expect to see a really powerful release probably in the next three to six months that has a heap more features. So right now, for the internal use case that Juno was designed for, which um, I'm not sure if I can say which one we're using it for, but maybe David will jump in and say. Um, in any event, that one only required a single primitive command to actually do. And the system that was initially running, the system that it's going to be piloting for replacing currently takes, I think, a week or two to do a transfer of something. And ours really only needed one command to do this multi-way transfer. So that's why the demo, that's why the demo, and that's why most of the other stuff only has a few commands in it, because we just really didn't need them for solving the business use case where we were building Juno for. Yeah, and, and Will, I think, you know, also if you want to just mention Masala, how we tied Masala in there, and how that opens up additional type of yeah, use Yeah, and also we have Masala, which is, say, Ethereum by code, uh, VM, so anything that you compile to Ethereum, it'll support and run. So anything that, any program you have in Ethereum that's or in Serpent that you can compile down, you'd be able to put onto this, onto Juno, and integrate it pretty trivially, and execute whatever you want. We have other languages that we can tack on. I know there's a Python implementation of Haskell that we could probably strip down and use. There's a Lisp version, that was the first thing we got running. It takes me at this point about an hour or two to integrate a new language into Juno. Anything that has something that's like a REPL, I can integrate pretty trivially at this point. Um, but it should be noted that deterministic state machines give you a lot more guarantees and we really prefer to use those versus something like a Python REPL or a Go REPL or something else. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I apologize for my uh, uh, audio is not very uh, very well here. Um, I'm uh, using my uh, computer network. Um, I, I have a follow-up question there the, on 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 the transaction. Since you have a, a backend um, a, a interpreter or or a whole virtual machine that be able to execute uh, things like um, uh, Ethereum uh, programming model, um, is your transaction a, a, a UTXO model, like a Bitcoin transaction model that carry along uh, inputs as well as expected outputs, or your transaction model is kind of like a, straight, a state transition model? Um, so I'm not too familiar with the UTXO model that carries things along. Um, 
Yeah, I have to be honest. I'm not too uh, current with. I'm not too familiar with the other options that you had said. I can briefly explain. I think something that may answer it, and you can jump in with another question if I get close enough. Um, so the way that it would work is that you know uh, Hopper doesn't have the ability to do any I/O. So there is just the state machine that's on every node that's getting stepped through after the inputs have been committed and replicated fully. And that builds up a state of the Hopper language. Um, and at every point, there is a diff of the state that comes out that we currently cache and can look at. Or So I guess the way that it works is you give the current state of the system and the new command to run to Hopper. Hopper takes the current state and the current command and then outputs the results of the command and the diff of the state and I believe the new state as well. And we don't know, we don't do a lot of um, interesting things with that. We just sort of propagate it and continue it on. At some point soon, we're going to be adding snapshotting so that when a new node comes up, it doesn't need to replay through the entire universe. It just can get a sign by the quorum or maybe signed by 90% of the nodes. Um, snapshot of what the state is and just start from there after it's validated all the log entries. Um, there's a bunch of different ways we can go. We're not entirely sure where we're going with it. Now, does that get to your question? Because I'm not yes, really that yeah. Yes, yes. So that, 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 that's perfect. What, what I call is, is a state transition model, uh, which means that a transaction will mutate the state from one uh, form to another. Yeah, yeah, and th yeah that's so exactly that the case. May, may I a bit uh, um, jump into here? Uh, all notion of UTXO is uh, unreferenced transaction output. Uh, so the first question is, if you would want to compare these two approaches, whether your transactions um, explicitly define an ordering by referring to earlier transactions? This would be the first question to compare with the UTXO model. Um, the second, uh, the second question is whether the state is entirely described by the fact that the transaction exists or the state is basically computed by the transactions. I understand uh, that the answer for the second question is that you have to execute the transactions to get the modified state. Um, yeah, so basically in our, our sort of um, our ephemeral state that we're building up um, by running each of these programs in succession. Um, that, that state contains the current state of the world of, uh, of who owns what, um, whether they be assets or um, you know, whatever you're modeling. And um, so each of our programs is going to be doing a transition from one current uh, consistent uh, sort of state of ownership to another state of ownership. And our program is statically verified at compile time ahead of time that um, that the program can only do valid transitions uh, from one ownership state to another. And so it's, it's a little bit different from the uh, UTXO model, um, but it's, uh, you know, you, get, you, can, you can model the same things and it's, you know, in, in some ways it's, uh, it's okay. Um, so I think there's another thing to add. Thank you, Brian. Um, Brian's one of the heads of the language uh, research. And I think that um, Hopper, being that we're developing internally and we're giving it all this power and that it's you know, completely pure and yada, 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 um, I think that we could add something similar to the, that, you know, maybe the UTXO model where you have um, things pointing at previous things, except we would do it at the bit of the uh, output level. So you have some state, you put in a transaction, what comes out is your new state, but also a diff and then the output that whatever came out as. And we could technically do an incremental hash of that diff if you wanted to be able to tie inputs to outputs all the way through eternity. Um, we don't currently do that. We have a lot of options and that's why we designed a language like this so that we can add these features in as we see them being needed. But currently, what RAP does is it gives you consensus around the inputs, and that's what we really want. So that if you know, there's some high bulk time, we can get consensus really quickly around the inputs, and then the state machine can be um, running up as fast as it possibly can. So the real key is to make sure that your state machine can transition through 
uh, programs faster than your consensus algorithm, given network latency, can actually come to consensus around things, so that your state machine isn't really that far behind. If that got to your question, uh, let me know. Otherwise, are there any other questions? Yeah, that's that was me, Thomas from Digitest. Yes, thank you. That uh, answers my question. Are there any further? I don't believe that was a question. Yes, I have a quick question. Can you can you talk yes. to the topology in, in terms of uh, what are you thinking in terms of the number of uh, trading partners, the number of servers, how often servers join and leave the network, and so forth. Um, so servers, so in rafts, you can only bring up or bring down. It's only guaranteed to be in a, to stay in a good state if you bring up or down or add or remove or do a key rotation, which we think is the same as adding or removing a server at the consensus level one at a time. Um, this We test this pretty heavily with, um, at least on our local system, by doing tons of terrible things to the program while it's running to see how it handles partitions and faults and other issues. And it seems to be, at least in our internal branch, very stable. Um, as for node count, we don't know. We need to actually get onto Amazon and start really hammering a thousand nodes and seeing what the performance is like and seeing what the issues are like. We need to geo-distribute to actually do some real testing. What we're thinking now, at least at the beginning, is having um, any trading partner who we were working with would have between three and maybe seven nodes locally. And um, probably we think three nodes locally and then four is read replicas in case one of those goes down. Then um, if there's a real fault in the system, then you have a read replica that can just be a standby member and then come online when, you know, by, of course, human interaction. Um, if you need to bring down your server for maintenance or if the hard drive explodes on one of your um, cluster servers, that one of your standbys will already be prepared and already have the state machine ready and everything else joined into the consensus for you. Um, for otherwise, there we have some interesting ideas for hacks for increasing performance even more, such as keeping a quorum in a local data center and then having nodes external to that. Um, the main reason for this is that that local data center's cluster will be able to get quorum very quickly, and the ones that are sort of the spokes in this mm -hmm. hub model will be read replicas and won't often participate in coming to quorum because the network latency is too long, but may in case of some outage or some other issue. Um, we don't know if we like that idea because that really makes it a single point of failure, and the whole point of using a graph like system is that you, instead of having really you know disaster recovery, a full backup, and that's a read replica of your massive Oracle database. You just have a bunch of nodes, and if your data center A goes down, then there's just a, a minor availability issue while there's an election that takes place, and that takes maybe a second or two. And then after there's a new leader, you just continue on as if nothing else happened, and if that node comes back online, then it catches up. So the topology, we're pretty flexible on it. We don't quite know what it's going to look like yet because we haven't really been able to take it into the real world until basically now that it's open source so we can have access to the tools that we need. Um, I'm really looking forward to the tests and I'm hoping that our suspicions and our research on our local machines proves to be true for doing a real distributed system. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, I see that there's a question from Jerome on the chat with regard to uh, do you plan to have contracts able to get or post data from contracts to the outside of the blockchain? Um, overall, we don't believe that the smart contract language should ever be able to do any I.O. because I.O. is inherently non-deterministic. And by I.O., I mean touch the outside world. We want it to be an equation, a mathematical equation effectively that just runs. Um, the way to get data in and out would be to have a message that brings the data in or a message that brings the data out. And this way you can be certain that when your state machine runs, everyone had access to the same thing. We can support doing other things if we wanted to. It's just a question of should we. You know, for example, we could support you know, doing Go, uh, like having Go just run in a Docker container, for example. You could just send a layer to some other system. The, the layer can be the message. You could send it to some other system. Uh, and then it applies a layer and then runs, and you can do whatever it wants. But 
my issue within our view of that is that it doesn't really provide you a lot of guarantees to with um, with regard to what state that state is actually in because it's an inherently non-deterministic system. We can also support tokenization and other things relatively speaking trivially if we just haven't had a use case for it yet. I mean, that's really the core of Juno is that it has support for a lot of other things. It's just that for our internal case that we built it for, it really only needs to be able to transfer money from account A to account B through you know, umpteen middlemen in a transactional way. Um, if there aren't any other questions, then I'm going to hand it back over to our uh, to the head of the meeting. Hello, uh, this is Suresh here. Hello. Hello. Yep. Yep. Uh, this is Suresh here. Uh, I just uh, wanted to understand uh, uh, one uh, aspect of the uh, you know this new network. Can this network or no, does this network has an ability to talk to existing systems like uh, you know, databases, let's say, push and pull, and can it accommodate any price feeds? Is it possible? Any what? What was the last bit after database? Any, any price feed? Um, data, data. Okay. Yeah, so um, the system, you can integrate, so we're seeing the, the way that we're looking at it is that the consensus layer should be effectively a, a black box, and anything that you want to run with the messages that the consensus layer comes to consensus around, um, it shouldn't be aware of them at all. It shouldn't, it's not something like epaxos or something else where you actually have to either make sure that the outputs are the same, to make sure that every state machine is in sync. We've talked about that previously, but also that there shouldn't be any notion of, um, let's say, you know, with epaxos you can sort of have this very quick path that allows unrelated things to be uh, transacted in different orders on a global spectrum, but um, they are causally consistent. So, you know, if you're transferring money from A to B and from C to D, you can run those either one before the other or the other before the other one, and it doesn't really matter because it's causally consistent. We want just a strict temporal ordering. We think it's easier to understand than implement. And based on that, we can integrate basically with anything, and you could just take the consensus layer, especially when we published the paper on the enhanced Tangrail protocol, you could just implement that anywhere else and just use this as a way of getting global ordering for anything you want. I would recommend using a deterministic state machine and that um, for Hopper we can add things in as need be, but so long as we don't really want it doing I.O. We really want the data being sent in as a message so that we can guarantee that if you're using Hopper that these state machines are all at a consistent state. The main worry is that let's say you have some programs to transfer funds from A to B and you want to get, and you also have to do an exchange rate um, account for that and you have one node that runs in Japan and one node that runs in London. And the node that's in Japan takes longer to hit the source of data that you need than the one that runs in London. There's no guarantees in RAP on when the state machine actually steps through the program, so you don't want the one in Japan getting different data than the one in London that it's going to use as an input for the equation it's going to do for the actual transfer. So that's one of the main reasons that we don't want it to be able to hit it from inside the state machine. Also, for example, just think of using, you know, rand or random number, or get random number. It's really something that you don't want in your state machine. So that's why we're making our language that doesn't explicitly have this stuff. So the ability to hit the outside world to get data through control flow is um, equivalent to me as doing random number to decide who you give money to. It's a bad idea for a distributed state machine that you want to actually have fully replicated. But we could support it if we needed to. We would just support it through a different language. And it would be a different system that has very different guarantees. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, definitely. Thank you. So Thank that you. does answer the price feed part of it. And uh, if at all, I have to, you know, uh, pull data from my existing database and, you know, uh, 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 put it into the system, uh, or pull some, you know, query some uh, uh, data from the uh, uh, stated block or, you know, the single block and push it back into my database. Uh, or does this uh, uh, you know new protocol allows us to do that? So the Tangro protocol could have that run somewhere if need be. I mean, it would just be a different messaging. It would just be a different type of message. Um, Hopper would not do that because one of the things that Hopper can't do is actually observe the world. It just tries to run and it works or it doesn't. So we very much don't want that. The way that I would architect a solution like that is I would say 
that I would begin some, let's say, you know, I only wanted to transfer money from Alice to Bob if Sam had, uh, you know, just tweeted about there was going to be rain in Chicago or something ridiculous like that. Um, I would have a system that would say, that would say, you know, I'm going to escrow Alice's money and then there's going to be a program that takes some cryptographically signed evidence that Sam has tweeted about rain in Chicago as evidence to actually finish the transaction to Bob. That would be one way that I would do it, so I'd move things into an in-between state, but all data that the contract needs to execute needs to be given to it for it to execute. It can't go out and get it at one time. It either has it there or it doesn't. Okay. It's just that I want to understand because uh, a Genesis block might have, uh, you know, on, on the pre-existed uh, you know, blockchain notion, should have some kind of state. Now that as we are starting the transactions, that's fine. But if at all we have to port existing systems onto this new protocol, then uh, what are the things, uh, uh, you know, I, I was interested in, uh, you know, if, if the new protocol supports me in a manner wherein I can pull some data or state of a specific uh, contract, uh, between multiple asset classes onto the system, and that would be of great help. Yeah, so I mean, the way that you would do it is you would make a, you know, that's your application. Your application is using um, a Juno cluster as a place for storage and application of data. You would have some application that's just pulling, 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 sees a change, puts that change into Juno, and then Juno goes and runs it through Hopper, and then whatever state occurs, occurs. And that's how I would architect that system. You really don't want your smart contract language being able to go and query these things and look at them because it just opens you up to a whole host of issues that you could have and issues that you will have like non-determinism. But okay. integrating it is an application level thing and you can sort of think of, you know, your application is going to integrate with some API that you build that runs inside of Hopper. But Hopper has to be given the things to do anything. It's a purely functional language. Okay, I, I got the uh, you know direction, and and uh, I really appreciate and thank you for your interest in the you know. Thank you patient. for your question. Is there anything further? I'm good. Yeah, I need I need. Uh, thank you. So I I think th this has been great. I think you know, David and and William. I wonder, you know, so specifically, what are you guys? Um, uh, you know, what are your thoughts? Um, uh, have you given thought to, for instance, you know, what sort of the next steps would be? Are we looking at, you know, thoughts of integrating the consensus capabilities into the pluggable consensus in OBC or, uh, um, you know, certainly Hopper, you know, I, I think that that sounds to me like something that would probably naturally fit into the, to the smart contract execution capabilities that we have in OBC, but Again, I'd like to understand and, and, and hear, and I'm sure everyone else says as well, your thoughts. Um, I, sort of what are, I can what start to answer that. Um, I can start to answer that, and then David can pick up um, anything that I've left off or whatever he wants to add. Um, I mean, right now, we need to finish the enhancements to the Tangro protocol and then implement them and then test them in a distributed way. We're close. We got sort of our hand forced to open source a little bit early, which is not bad. We for somehow someone managed to find Juno and put it on Hacker News and it was front page yesterday and now I have more favorites of any repo that I've ever made. Um, and I didn't tell yeah. anyone it was I just discovered it, uh, which I was quite surprised uh, by. But um, so for the next steps, I mean the first next step for with regards to the engineering team is we need to, when we're already in head down mode, we have a um, hopeful production pilot that we're going to be putting out very soon and there's a lot of stuff. Uh, with regard to integration with the uh, consensus API, we need to look at the API. We've tried making a sort of general purpose API for consensus before, and yeah. we haven't had a lot of success with it. But we've, we've tried to make, we've tried to abstract the consensus layer out of Juno so that we could try TBFT alongside Byzantine Wrap, alongside other things. And we haven't had a lot of luck doing it in any really type safe or good way or non hacky way. There's just a lot of devil in the details that you have to fix. So we need to look at that to see if that's a capacity. Um, with regard to Hopper, it needs a couple of months of his head down work to really get the first um, version where we have all these awesome powers. All these awesome powers. Um, but we're not quite there yet. Um, David, do you have any comments? 
Yeah, I guess, you know, I just add that, you know, to the extent that we've been discussing, you know, um, like a, a two-stack solution where we've got a sort of something that we think we could get something out this year with and a much more flexible long-term smart contract-based architecture for um, experimentation and evolution and, and things of that nature. Um, you know, for some specific types of use cases, again, you know, perhaps use cases that involve very high transaction volumes, um, you know, we've, we felt that this, this is interesting technology um, that uh, possibly could be pluggable into that more open, modular, extensible uh, strategic architecture we've been discussing yep. um, as an option. So, so again, it's, you know, as we're as we're building out our stack and we're looking for various use cases um, and you know this this type of technology could offer solutions that just you know may not work so well with some of the existing ones so we wanted to put it out there uh, let people take a look at it you know maybe uh, in, in a couple of weeks when we're all together um, uh, during our our hackathon <laughs> uh, if someone uh, you know we we may form a project where you know we would look to be able to plug plug this consensus model into that stack and, and demonstrate it um, that way. You know, that, that's the sort of thing we were thinking, uh, you know, as, as we encounter specific use cases where we think this could be appropriate, you know, we wanted to make it available and see how it could fit in. Excellent. All right. Yeah, I think, I think that, that's sort of what I was thinking as well. I just want to make sure you guys were um, thinking similarly. So thank you very much. Um, okay, so we have uh, a little bit less than half an hour left. And we have a couple of agenda. Where did my agenda go? Um, so we have uh, a project proposal template proposal um, from uh, Vipin that has been out on the on the wiki. Um, and uh, Vipin, if you're on, if you want to begin to present, and then I think we should have discussion about. Um, you know the template and whether or not we uh, you know from a TSC perspective think that it's um, underkill overkill you know just right you know bowl of porridge uh, and then I think we have to have a little bit of a discussion as I mentioned earlier about the project life cycle and the need for something along the lines of what you know some of our sister boards have you know with uh, some sort of an incubator process and a process for Elevating to active, and then a process for, you know, graduating from there into, you know, being designated as part of the core and so forth. So, um, so why don't you start with presenting your uh, template proposal? I don't know. If, um, you're yeah. prepared to sort of show it. Uh, I think I think if we get if we get the uh, presenter given to, uh, presentation mode rather given the that would be good. Yeah, um, I would. I, I'm not uh, going to present it because where I am, I'm prevented from going to Google Docs, so uh, okay. I cannot do um, that. I cannot uh, do that. But Todd, maybe you could um, grab the link and, and, and present it, maybe. Yep. Uh, sure thing. I'll drop that into the chat window. One second. Into the chat window or to the? I was just gonna, you know, if you could just put it up in the in the. But either give me the the stick. Anyway, I mean, there is nothing uh, much to really uh, talk about there. We had discussed it in detail in the, you know, two two meetings ago, and I had gotten uh, some feedback from various people, and I had tried to incorporate it, uh, but basically it is just text, you know, slightly structured. Um, I think the next steps would be if there's something seriously lacking in it, you know. I need to know about it. Uh, the other point is that uh, what are we doing this for? Meaning to help people put together proposals. So um, one of the one of the uses, uh, one of the directions in which we could go is one have a, a template with actual text in it with those sections, and then let uh, use that as a skeleton for people to uh, just put together their own proposals. That's one way. The other way is uh, use a proposal builder software, but 
uh, I would incline in the in the short term at least to not not to attempt to do that. Just just do the you know skeleton. Uh, like I said, you know, it basically is awaiting your comments. So as long as you can, uh, as long as you want to comment on it and or bless it or say we are not interested in doing this. Let's let everybody do their own templates. I mean, their own um, proposals. Um, so that that that's where I am. You know, basically. Okay. Any thoughts or discussion? I mean, to, you know, personally, I was looking through this, and I think, you know, there's a lot to be said for this. Um, I think, you know, some of the, uh, you know, getting into the solution aspect of things, um, at least uh, initially struck me as being a little bit um, too prescriptive. I think a lot of times you want to um, just sort of you know, put forth a justification for going off and doing something, um, and maybe you have a couple of ideas about how you might do that, but, um, and, and you just want to sort of start, you know, working through that process itself um, with some with some experiments. It may not work out, you, you know, need to pivot and so forth, but, um, yeah, uh, but I, sure. I do agree that, you know, we need to have a framework that we can you know, present to the technical steering that we can go through and review and discuss, you know, is this the direction we want to go, what use cases is it solving, those kinds of things, I, I do think are uh, very valuable to to sort of kick off and say, hey, Beryl, let's go off and work on that. And, and so that, you know, somebody who wants to lead it can say, hey, who's with me? Yeah, I mean, uh, the whole idea was, uh right in the beginning of the of the document it says it's not prescriptive it is just uh for you to at least think about all of these aspects uh, because in the in the beginning uh it talks about that this document is not prescriptive in fact that is those are the very words used in there uh so all it all it's saying is uh, like trying to put some kind of structure around your thoughts in terms of writing a, a proposal um, so that that is nothing but a list of items that you should at least have thought about if not if you're not addressing them that is fine but you know uh, so it's it's something to guide your guide people to right uh, no, I, I, and I think, you know, like I said, some of these things are good thoughts, but I think they may be overkill in some cases. I was looking through at some of the other, um, uh, you know, some of the other approaches that some of our sister projects um, on the Linux Foundation do, and, you know, uh, a, a number sort of have, um, uh, you know, a very rough template of, you know, uh, here's the name of the, and, and here's a, an abstract of it, you know, here's who we think is going to work on it, and so forth. Um, and here's what we think we want to accomplish, knit it out into, um, uh, you know, into a wiki template that people can easily, pick up, you know, fill out and, and add to uh, a list to be considered. Um, and so I, I, I do think that something like this is worthwhile. So I would, uh, you know, I, I don't see a whole lot of comments. I think maybe, um, you know, we need to give it another week for people to go through and and, and, and comment and make suggestions. Uh, I believe that um, Mike had sent a list of other, you know, examples of, you know, groups like Open Daylight. In fact, I think I had that one open uh, here someplace. Um, yeah, so Open Daylight, if people can see my screen, um, you know, they have a project life cycle and then they have a uh, sort of a, a template of <clears throat> a fake proposal that, you know, again, it has many of the same features that Bithens, um proposes, um, but it's fairly straightforward to fill out, and then there's examples that, that you know, others have, have done, um, you know, where it's, it's flushed out. Again, it's not, not very difficult to, um, you know, uh, you know, you don't have to go overboard, but it's just enough so that the Technical steering has enough need to uh, to review, discuss, and to um, agree or disagree to 
um, you know, to kick off as a as an incubating project. So I would encourage people to go through and review Pippin's proposal, um, add comments in the margin, and let's be let's be prepared uh, for next week to uh, discuss it in a little bit more depth. Uh, any other comments, questions, concerns? So that brings me to the to the second part of this, and that's the life cycle. Um, again, I go back to the daylight. Daylight had a pretty good here we go country life cycle. Um, uh, process in place for their project life cycle is described by this flowchart, you know, where you, you kick off with a, a, a given proposal, um, goes through review by the technical steering after a couple of weeks of time for people to stew on it, um, and then it either is or isn't, you know, granted uh, um, uh, entrance into incubation. Um, after incubation, you know, when it's given enough time, then you would bring forward a proposal to have it graduated. That again would be, you know, reviewed by the technical steering, approved. If it was approved, it would put, be put into the sort of the, um, uh, the, the I call it, let's say, the active or mature uh, projects. In other words, we've gotten to the point where the code is stable, it does what it purports to do. Um, it's something that we can integrate into a release, um, and uh, and so we put it into a mature bucket, if you will. And then um, uh, I guess there's sort of two other aspects here. I'm not sure that I would agree necessarily that something goes from core necessarily to the top level, but there's a notion in their uh, project lifecycle of having a, a top level project, which is something that has sub projects underneath it, um, and then there's something core. And core essentially, you know, would be I think part of, and again, I think you know this is something that you know we're going to have to collaborate on with the board and so forth. But eventually, there'll be some discussion around conformance and and compliance and certification and so forth as to whether or not something can be granted hyperledger. And for that, um, typically, we would probably define. Certain set of the components and modules and so forth as part of the core, and so you know, our, our, and, and those projects would get a little bit more scrutiny. Uh, you know, more. Um, you know, those would be the ones that we focus on uh, for uh, cutting a release, making sure those were in ship shape, and other parts obviously could be included to a release, but you know, our the, the focus of the group and the energies and the uh, sort of the excess scrutiny that we put would be placed on things that are part of the core because those are the most critical aspects um, and, and the things that would, by which we'll be measured, I'm sure. Um, uh, so I would put forward that, you know, I, I wouldn't mind if we could have something along the lines of this particular process in place for our own group and that so I would propose to the technical steering um, consideration again. I mean, I think we could, um, you know, we can probably uh, noodle a little bit on this um, uh, and think about you know the, the life cycle itself just a little bit again I don't know that you necessarily um, uh, have the same the same uh, flow but um, I'd like to propose this at least as an idea that the testing steering could um, start kicking around in their own heads and then again next week be prepared to come back and um, and let's see if we can't hammer out something um, uh, that that we can adopt as our own uh, life cycle process. Uh, and I welcome anybody to chime in with some thoughts, whether or not you're on the TSC. Nobody has any thoughts, or everyone's on mute. <laughs> Hey, Chris, this is Dave Volt. Yeah, so, I mean, this looks like a great start. Um, and like you said, uh, you know, we want to have something that we can adopt our own. So, um, yeah, I'm just kind of re reading through this. It, it makes sense, logical. I think uh, a good portion of this we could directly adopt. I, I don't see any any problem with that. Yeah, that, that's kind of the way I was thinking it. Other thoughts? Uh, it's Mick. Um, I just like a little bit of time to look through this and think about it a little bit more, but um, it's pretty generic. So 
looks fine. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, that, that's essentially what I intended. I think everybody should uh, take a look at this. I'll uh, actually I'll put the link in the chat so that it's recorded. And hi, Tim. hi, Chris. It's, it's Richard. Richard here. Um, Sorry oh, I missed this because I, I was called. I was, I was called away from my desk temporarily. Um, I was just trying to get my head around um, what a, a hyperledger project or sub project would be. So, so would the the, the work you you and DA are doing to to, to prototype a merge code base would that be an example of a project? And another one might be to I don't know maybe evaluate how the, the JP Morgan code could be used, or would it be something completely different, such as? Well, actually, I'm not quite sure. I'm just trying to get a, get, get a feel for what a project might be um, in this context. So, so, so right now, you're right. We're working through um, a bit of an experiment in the project. Um, you know, thinking about integrating the DEH and, and IBM code bases, for instance. Right. So that's that's an example. Um, let's just assume a thought exercise here, just for a moment, and say, okay, so out of that, you know, we are able to sort of graduate. Um, uh, you know, whatever we come up with at, at the end of that. Now, uh, there are going to be a number of different components of that um, that, you know, could be independently managed as a project, right? You know, there's a consensus uh, API and mechanism, probably one or two default ones, and then there's a smart contracts component of it, there's a ledger component of it, and so forth. Um, you know, you could you could treat them all as one project, but then, you know, as as the work expands, um, you know, it becomes a little bit more easy to manage these things somewhat independently of one another, uh, especially from an open source perspective, because you want to give people opportunity to sort of jump in and dig in at at a, at a place that of their choosing. So I would I would envisage that eventually the various components become projects. And then that there would be other projects that would be proposed that would, um, you know, propose to augment and add new features, you know, add confidentiality, add privacy, add, you know, um, you know, or refactor this for better performance. Or, you know, it, it, it's really, it, it's, it's the desire to start um, a, a piece of work. It could be a bounded piece of work that's so to a particular component, or it could be something that's cross-component. Um, uh, or it could be a new component itself, um, but, but again, it would be a, 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 a piece of work that somebody would say, hey, who's with me, um, and where somebody could be driving it potentially long-term. Uh, again, some of these would be features or functions that may, um, you know, remain on as something that we work on uh, ad nauseum, or, you know, that sort of after the project is over, it just becomes part of it or subsumed into a, a higher-level, top-level project. Does that make sense? Richard? It does. Sorry, it took me about five seconds to find my mouse and then get it over to the right screen. Complete incompetence oh, of GoToMeeting. I'm sorry. Yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Chris, I have a question. Um, yeah. So you used, you, I thought I heard you say something like, um, Hyperledger branded or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't see anything like that in the flow in the description. What What do you mean by that? Oh, okay. So, um, so if we if we take a look at various other projects that are out there, let's take OpenStack or Cloud Foundry. Um, uh, one of the aspects of uh, initiatives like that is to be able to sort of manage the brand, right? And so if, you know, going forward, we want to be able to manage the brand, and if people want to be able to use Hyperledger, um, uh, the brand, in their in their products and offerings, and say, oh, we're, you know, the IBM Hyperledger, or we're, you know, the, the, the JP Morgan Hyperledger, whatever it might be, um, Typically, in order to make sure that we have that the open source communities have a certain degree of um, control over that brand, so that it doesn't become um, diluted by people claiming it without having any kind of you know without there being any kind of substance behind that that branding, um, they would typically sort of come up with a um, 
certification or you know com conformance criteria that have to be met in order to use the brand. So that's that's what I was really referring to. Now we don't have that yet, right? We don't have any code yet, right? But um, that would be my expectation going forward that the, the hyperledger project, you know, the governance board would probably say yes, we do want to be able to sort of manage our brand, not have it diluted uh, by actors in the market who are just using it, you know, using the name uh, sort of in vain, um, and so that there would be some sort of um, uh, process put in place by the governing board that would be, um, uh, they would ask the technical steering to sort of manage a, you know, a test uh, service certification test suite, for instance, that if you're going to claim that you're, you know, you're leveraging the hyperledger code, that you have to be able to, you know, demonstrate that you're exposing all the right APIs, that, you know, in, in some cases it may be that you're using specific releases of the code and so forth. Um, but there would be some criteria that we could use that we could measure as to whether or not somebody who is using the brand, you know, would have to substantiate that claim by being able to pass a set of tests. So, so that's what I meant. Is, is this a is this a common uh, use of Linux Foundation working groups? And and, and again, um, I don't know if this is a question for Todd or. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to to Mike. I mean, you know, I don't want to speak for the Linux Foundation, but you know, a, a number of them do. Yes. Mike. Mike, if you're talking, you're muted. He's on mute. Todd, can you unmute him? Here we go. Hello? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, some of our projects do, uh, you know, do something like that. You know, it's a little bit early to discuss that here, I think, um, just because we don't even know sort of what the what, what the structure of the project even looks like at this point. Um, but, you know, some of our projects, you know, there are companies or participants who want to say that, you know, they have solutions that are, you know, work with Hyperledger based on Hyperledger powered by Hyperledger type of statements or marks or things like that. Um, again, it's quite a bit early to have that discussion here right now, but some of them do decide to go do that. What kind of recourse do you have? Meaning if somebody did claim it without actually going through this branding process, what, uh, what do you what can what can be done about it? Well, you have you have trademark rights in the name, so you can enforce the mark. Is essentially what happens. And generally what the way it works is that the community comes up with a set of guidelines or you know, uh requirements or what what not that um that they can all agree on as sort of the base for the basis for using the mark and you have trademark rights to enforce. And who owns that trademark? Is that uh, owned by the Linux Foundation? Trademark's owned by the Linux Foundation, but the group, you know, is the one who decides, you know, what they want to do with that. Right. Again, it's entirely up to the group. If, if some of our projects don't want to do that, don't get involved in it, and that's fine too. I think it's a bit early to have that discussion here. Yeah, I, I, I was just putting that out, saying that that's what some groups do. So I don't actually expect that that would happen. But this, as Mike said, it's a bit early days. So I don't want to scare people. But Okay. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Whoops. I'm going to stop sharing here. Find my desktop. And, uh, and so we have the ongoing work of uh, the white paper, as I mentioned. I promise to do that. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that this afternoon. 
Um, and as I mentioned, Mick and I were working on a code of conduct. Um, Mick, I sent you um, some thoughts. Um, and so I think uh, we just need to sort of circle back with one another and then maybe we can present something um, uh, as a starting point for you know further discussion. And um, and then there's the requirements. And uh, I apologize, but I think uh, I'm trying to remember. I think it was um, possibly Accenture's uh, on the board call. Um, I, I mentioned, you know, that we're trying to pull together a requirements group and that I was looking for somebody to herd those cats, um, you know, maybe as a requirements work group chair. Um, and uh, I think Accenture is potentially going to be uh, proposing that they might uh, be interested in leading that. But uh, I'll get, I'll open it up here if anybody is interested in helping to lead a work group to pull together the various use cases and requirements, and um, uh, you know, let's let's get those documented and put into a position where um, we can present that to the TSC and we can agree on whether they're in or they're out or what the part is and so forth, so that we get a better sense of exactly what the scope of of what we're trying to build will be. I think this is a very critical piece of the work. I would certainly expect that at the face to face will be making part of the considerable progress on that as well. Um, but it does need somebody to help for the cats. Chris? Um, yep. This is Patrick Holmes at Intel. I, I'm volunteering to do that or co-lead with somebody. Awesome. All right, Patrick. Um, and you may get a co-lead tomorrow. I think I have a call with somebody, I think, from Accenture. Tomorrow, um, and so they may have uh, somebody to help um, share some of that burden with you. But I, I definitely appreciate the offer. Um, and uh, so anybody who's uh, again, I think there are a number of names that uh, people that express an interest in participating in the requirements of the use case gathering. Um, and so uh, you know, maybe uh, Patrick, if you could just uh, send a quick note to the to the list and 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 invite others to, to get back with you and let's see if we can't, you know, form um, a group and, and, and get to work on uh, collecting and collating the various requirements in these cases. That'd be super nice. Okay. All right. So we're at end of job. Um, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank JP Morgan for the in-depth review of Juno and Hopper. and um, and Vipin for his uh, project proposal template. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, and we'll talk to you all next week, if not before, in Slack and on the mailing list. Thanks, Chris. Okay, thanks, Chris. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.